customers like being guided, but they hate being railroaded. And with a lot of bots, it does feel like we're railroading them into like, well, you have to communicate with it this way. And you have, in order to get what you want, you have to do it like this. And users don't like that. So that's another good thing that I think is going to come from LLMs and all of that. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Randy Sar, and I have an amazing guest today that is going to be talking to us about conversational design. We've had other guests before, uh, but now we're kind of diving into the community and really uh, learning about the different best practices that you can apply towards your business, whether you're in a contact center, no matter what industry that you're in. So let's get to it. Our guest today is a conversational designer with many years of experience, and she is within the insurance industry, and it's none other than Rachel Whitehorn. Rachel, welcome to the show. Hi, Randy. Thanks for having me. So excited that you're here. Uh, We've been talking a lot about conversational design as a practice uh, on this podcast. And, you know, when I met you and I saw you on LinkedIn, we connected and we had a great kind of prep call. And and I think this is going to be a really uh, interesting show. So appreciate you coming on. Yeah, me too. So let's start off the podcast like we always do is debunking a myth. So from your perspective, what is one myth or perhaps misconception within the conversational design space and specifically within the enterprise that you would like to debunk? So I think the one that comes to mind is when COVID hit, lots of companies we saw in the industry and in many other industries, um, everyone was very excited to get a chat bot. And it seemed like a very quick yep. solution to all of the uh, care center or call center problems they totally. were facing. Um, but with that came, I think, a rush because everyone's expectation is you insert a chat bot, it answers a few questions, you get you know some, some yeah. work off of your agent's plate, and yay, you've saved the company a bunch of money. But unfortunately, that myth should be debunked that it's that easy. You can't just plug in a chat bot and expect everything to be solved. Um, the organizations that, you know, thought they could do this in a very quick yeah. way probably didn't involve all of the departments necessary, uh, the people that, you know, right. could have helped them, or maybe they didn't even have conversation designers. It wasn't intentional. So the myth for me is, you know, chat bots are good, virtual assistants, they're good, but they have to be done the right way for them to benefit you. Otherwise you're risking your brand because if the comp, you know, if the experience isn't what customers were expecting, then you've kind of, you know, let everybody down and I'm not sure you've saved anyone, any money. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So you've lost that one chance, right? That first impression. And yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. So that's definitely, uh, I definitely can relate to that. Uh, There's definitely a lot of brands I've interacted with, uh, you know, a couple years ago and it was just a chat bot that, purely was I had its, its flow already designed. If I were to veer off in any way, <laughs> it didn't know what to do. It didn't understand my responses um, and it didn't yeah. store my responses. So I definitely think there's a uh, room for improvement in, in, those, in those experiences. Yeah. And there's something, there's a, I have a theater in background or a background in theater and yeah. there's this saying like Chekhov's gun, like never bring a gun onto stage that won't be fired never do anything, you know, unless it's intrinsic to the story. For me and customer experience, never introduce a tool or a channel that's not ready or like not going to go well. Um, You have (laughs) to be ready for what you're bringing on stage. Yeah, for sure. That's that's a a good point. All right. So let's talk about the expectations. We talked a little bit about it in your your response, but what are the user expectations? Um, You know, from what you're building uh, at your company, you know, what are the things that people expect? How should it be built? Like, how should it be designed? Yeah, you and I talked about this a little bit in our conversation we had about, you know, our user expectations changing based off of all the conversations happening around large language models and chat GPT and all that stuff. And I would argue they are not. 
Um, they're not changing because user expectations have always been, you know, here's my problem. They're going to introduce themselves to a bot and say, I need this fixed. And they don't know yet whether it's a great bot. They don't know whether it's just an FAQ chat bot, uh, but they know what they need and their expectations are that the bot will be able to help them. So if quickly and basically do things that an agent will do. Are they surprised yeah. when the bot isn't able to fulfill that all the time? I don't think they're surprised. I think they're disappointed. But um, <laughs> these yeah. large language models that are being introduced and used more by businesses and will continue to be integrated with businesses, all that to me is us really for the first time uh, honoring and fulfilling these customers' expectations because if they go in there expecting to have a conversation – not many bots have been able to achieve that really uh, and not yeah. for that many use cases. So the users haven't changed. <laughs> We're just <laughs> catching up in a way. Yeah. And so from a, a business perspective, uh, what are your thoughts around businesses trying to meet those expectations? Um, you know, and what needs to change? So I have a lot of empathy for business leaders that are being faced with this because, you know, especially with industries that are regulated, highly regulated, like the insurance industry, you don't want to risk anything going awry. You don't want to, right. you know, risk litigation because of something your chat bot said, right? Um, yeah, right, right. Yeah. But people are going to need to be brave uh, when it comes to this. Probably the less litigious industries will need to go first a little bit when it comes yeah. to integrating LLMs. And figuring out everything that comes with it and what can go wrong. Um, But I think, you know, we talked at the beginning a little bit about being intentional in the way that you design. So all these companies that are interested in having their virtual assistants go well, uh, they need to be intentional. I think about involving conversation designers and designers need to be ready to change as I think They've always been, you know, conversation design is different yeah. every single day, but, you know, adapting to the new tech and being willing to become a tech person. I don't sure. know that there's going to be a huge difference in the future between conversation designer and AI trainer. I, I predict oh, those two okay. roles are going to merge a little bit more. Right. Um, so those are a few things that I think will need to change if okay. that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it does. I mean, I think AI and data definitely play a big part in training. It's, it's definitely one of the things when you're building a self-service solution. Yeah. Um, and just for people that aren't familiar with you, kind of, what's your background? How did you get into this uh, you know, stage uh, of, of design and stage of uh, leveraging this type of technology? Yeah, I haven't listened to everyone who's come onto the podcast. I've listened to a few, but I feel like everyone who's ever been asked that is like, I fell into it. Yes, me too. <laughs> um Well, and everyone seems to have these varied backgrounds. And mine is theater and accounting, which is strange to begin with, I guess. Uh, But then it went into the CX realm, which is much more involved. But I think um, just being lucky to be in the CX space where I was that, you know, it it kind of fell into my lap, this area, and I fell in love with it pretty quickly. Um, But it's always been people who were interested in tech and psychology and writing you know, and wanting to kind of be a jack of all trades. It's those types of people that seem to find this area. And they're all very cool. Not me. Everyone else is very (laughs) cool. (laughs) You're cool. You're cool. Cool. All right. Um, And you're based in in Florida, um, which is a great state. And and tell us, uh, you know, one of the things um, when we, you know, let's get back to the kind of the technology side of the questions. Um, When you're building these self-service experiences uh, and in your experience one you know how do you go about uh, focusing on adoption and driving engagement because i think that's one of the key things when you you know you want to be able to get them you know not only to solve the problem and question but how do you get them to the answer that they want and get them to ask the right question like how does that happen It's hard, but, you know, something I'm becoming more and more familiar with on my side is that product mindset of prototyping early, prototyping a lot um, and speaking with your users a lot more and not just like trying things that you think might work and, you know, having a list of features and all that. 
So for adoption, I, for a lot of chatbots, I think adoption is not the first problem. It When people are looking for help and they see the little icon in the bottom right, you know, a lot of people are going yeah. to click it, whether they engage with that bot. Now that comes, you know, down to, is it what they were expecting to see? You have to do a lot of user testing to see if your intro is going to actually make people feel like the bot can help them. Um, and then, you know, if it's not trying out a few different things or talking to users, what did they expect? But having them go the right way can be difficult because customers like being guided, but they hate being railroaded. And with a lot of bots, it does feel like we're railroading them into like, well, you have to communicate with it this way. And you have, in order to get what yeah. you want, you have to do it like this. And right. users don't like that. So yeah. that's another good thing that I think is going to come from LLMs and all of that more AI side is we don't have to railroad them as much to get what they want. Right. Yeah, they can talk in plain language, right? Yeah. I think that's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, <clears throat> and uh, kind of your mindset, I, I want to dive into that a bit in terms of how you design. Um, are you freehand? Do you go on the computer and kind of draw out the flows? Like, how do you go about doing that that flow and, and incorporating uh, the, the experience that you want to incorporate? Yeah. Luckily for me, I think having a background in you know, being on the line in the call center and being an agent helping customers. Um, a lot of that experience plays into it. So as an agent, I would know what would come next and what to say and thinking from that yeah. mindset. But as far as actually designing, uh, for me, I think it starts as, you know, either in Figma or something else like that. Yeah. Plotting out what happens next, um, yeah. trying to do sample dialogues, but uh, really back and forth between me and our conversational copywriter. Uh, her name is Sam and we go back and forth a lot and decide together what would happen because I think sometimes yeah. it's hard to design uh, in a silo and isolated like that. So for me, it's being oh. collaborative as much as I can be in every design. Cool, cool. Uh, so this is a great segue to the next question. Um, you know, as we, as the people are listening in, they are, either walking and they're journeying, they're just starting, or maybe they're running and they're, you know, conversation AI kind of plus. Um, but for those that are just starting, what are your thoughts around the key players in building these user experiences and building these conversational experiences? Who are the main players, the you know, main teammates that you work with that you think other companies should, you know, have similar uh, coworkers, similar groups? Yeah. Well, if you're just starting up, I think making sure that you treat it like you would any other product, making sure that marketing is on board and understands legal is ready to sign off on any you know verbiage that's being yeah. used. Uh, very much make sure that your data team is ready to, you know, uh, you approve whatever data is going to be used or and then set yeah. up dashboards and whatever monitoring you need afterwards. Like all of that needs to be there. Uh, and if it's not, it's going to make the job as the designer uh, a lot harder. So once your infrastructure is set up in the right way and staffing is good for live agents, yeah. um, you you have to have your designer and you have to have a copywriter, in my opinion. I think sometimes oh. those two roles are seen as one or, like I said, my preference yeah. is to be collaborative. So to at least have those two people, great. And then uh, a dedicated AI trainer uh, hopefully more than mm -hmm. one uh, who, and they both also serve like an analytics role where they can come back to the designers, report back some of the findings yeah. that aren't working so well. So that core group, I think, is what you have to have if you're going to start. Obviously, if you're a lucky company with a bunch of money and a bunch of positions, <laughs> you can grow that. But at those three yeah. core positions I mentioned are really fundamental, uh, in my opinion. To make a bot work. Awesome. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with AI trainer, um, can you just uh, repeat that again? Like, what is that role specifically? Because I don't think we've talked about that on the podcast before. Yeah, they're fundamentally they are supposed to train the bot uh, with utterance and intent matching. So they're the ones you know going through and saying like, okay, you know, these are our twenty to fifty training utterances that we're going to use. Um, 
for this intent. And then they make sure that, you know, that sort of training is even. It's not overtrained, undertrained. That's the core of what they would be doing is helping the NLU, you know, be where it's supposed to be. Okay, cool. No, that's good to know. All right. Uh, so uh, you're listening to Conversations of the Matter podcast. I'm your host, Randy Kassar, and we're talking to Rachel here. Uh, and we're having a great conversation on conversational design, on designing self-service experiences. So, Rachel, this is a super, super good information. So thanks uh, for sharing it with us so far. Yeah. So um, as we go into the uh, – you know, we talked about AI trainer, which is awesome. And I think that's a, definitely a, a key role. Uh, conversational designer, your role specifically is a key role within a group. Um, if you were to think about kind of a master class in conversational design, uh, what would that entail? Um, you know, what are the things that enterprises should be training their, their designers on uh, and those that are you know, building these self-service experiences? That's a great question. I There's so much to learn. And I think the onus is kind of on the designer to continuously learn on their own because so much changes all the time. But the fundamentals should always be true. I think you should always advocate as much as you can with your product manager for use cases that matter, that are truly solving a customer problem. Um mm-hmm. And being able to speak intelligently about the analytics. Like, I think what I'm afraid of for some designers is that they box themselves in where they're like, I'm a designer. This is what I do. This is all that I do. Uh, And everything else is, you know, other people's problems. Where many of us will know that, like, yes, your title may be that. But the organization expects a lot from you. A lot of different hats you're going to have to wear so if you can speak to stakeholders uh, very well about your results and automation and your containment, uh, and you can just be an advocate for the bot, you know, that's that's something I'm passionate about and would speak to is you have to have a stake in this company and you have to have a stake in the product. And so you have to know more than just just design uh, yeah. to to really function at your best. So in a weird way, my master class would not be about design. It would be about the other parts of it that make you a gotcha. great conversation designer. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned one thing uh, in that answer was around products, right? You treat this as a product, just like any yeah. other company. Right? You ha- I, I think, think you key. have to. Yeah. It, with that importance, because I feel like there's like this orphanage out there of bots that have been forgotten <laughs> or just, you know, no one's yeah. training it or no one's updating it. And if you're going to invest money and time and salaries into a bot, don't let it become an orphan, you know, really dedicate everything it takes to make it good. Yeah, that's a great point. I love the the analogy orphan. Um, Well, this is awesome. So, uh, you know, your role uh, is definitely very unique over the past couple of years within, within, um, within the space. Uh, and I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how do you see it changing uh, two or three years from now um, in terms of not just your role, but in terms of how people build uh, these self-service experiences? Yeah, I'm an optimist in a way, uh, more like I, I'm a dreamer about how quickly tech can meet my expectations. But what I would love to see within the next two or three years and what we're seeing with companies like Gigi and all of these people trying to make generative AI so that the conversation designer is curating responses, not creating responses. Um, What like my dream is for the bot to report to me. You know, I'm working with an LLM. Uh, It's it's answering so many questions without a whole lot of guidance. It's working off of a framework of intents. But when it goes off path, it doesn't have to be like, sorry, I didn't understand you. Like it can, (laughs) you know, the LLM can kind of handle it better. But uh, I want it to report to me like if there's a high volume of questions that's happening because something changed in the world. And I, as a conversation designer, can kind of like teach it in that moment uh, what the company line should be, you know, what the bot should be telling kind of like a true right. assistant for me. And then at the end of the week, yeah. I want it to report to me, these are the things I wasn't so confident about, like uh, below 65% yeah. confidence. Uh, can you help me? And I'll be like, you should have said this. You could say this instead. And working with the bot in a way that maybe 
it doesn't feel like we're doing today, but yeah. that's the dream. And that's what I mentioned before about that's like feeling like not just designer, but kind of combo AI trainer, yeah. because really it's helping the bot to answer uh, yeah. users questions. All right. I love that utopia. I think that can happen. I know uh, within two to three right. years, probably not. <laughs> Well, you never know. I mean, this technology is changing every six months. I mean, yeah. you know, six months ago, no one was talking about generative AI. So there's a lot of stuff that's happening on that end. So it'll be interesting to see where, where things go. Um, all right. So let's get to the rapid fire to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Uh, and, you know, we learned a little bit about your background in, in the, uh, on the theater side. Uh, so let's just start with that one there. Um, if you were to go to New York City and go to a Broadway show, what would that Broadway show be? Hades Town. Okay, it's so good. It I think it came out around COVID and then it unfortunately lost steam as it were just because people couldn't yeah. go see it, but it's so yeah. good. It's about Orpheus and Eurydice, the old Greek myth, and they're down in Hades Town and it's a great musical. Everyone should listen to it if they can't see it. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'll do a search for that. I haven't heard of that one before. Very cool. Um, and then we ask this uh, with a lot of people um, on the podcast. If you could call a contact center or and or, or call center or contact center and you could get your problem solved without a doubt and the person that was answering the call could be a celebrity, a musician, an artist, maybe someone from Broadway, uh, that was dead or alive, who would that person be? This is very difficult, but I think Ian McKellen is probably my, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. And oh, I just, yeah. just feel like Gandalf's taking care of me, you know, <laughs> would be very he's nice. Got his, yeah. yeah. He's got his staff and everything. Uh, your payment did not pass. Just kidding. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it'd be great. All right, Ian McKellen. That's that's the first. So we haven't had that one on the podcast before. Okay, so, great. Uh, that, that's an awesome one. Uh, what's one thing not on your LinkedIn profile? I was uh, gonna say D and D, but I think that actually is on my profile. But um, <laughs> okay, uh, I've I've gotten into this uh, this company called Hunt a Killer. So it's like these mystery uh, detective boxes you receive in the mail. Oh. Uh, and you solve a mystery. You can do it by yourself or with friends. And it's really cool. Yeah. And they give you like, here's, you know, the letters and the diary of the person. And you get all these trinkets and maps. And oh, so cool. for people that like those little tactile clues and to physically yeah. like have that stuff, it's so much fun. So I'd recommend Hunt a Killer uh, <laughs> box sets to everybody as well. Awesome. Sounds like a Law & Order episode. <laughs> some of them are. And some of them are like old timey. It's cool. Yeah, cool. Awesome. And uh, what would be your best day? And this, when I'm, and people, you know, I preface this with a best day is not necessarily need to be work related, but like if you were to have a good day in the middle of the week and, you know, everything was just like nailed it, what would be that best day? I think um, I would get up when I say I'm going to get up, which never happens. Uh, <laughs> and then I would like have my coffee, get all my emails out of the way really quickly. And then my boss would surprise me and say, everyone has a free day off. Mm. You're welcome. And then I think I would, um, my husband works at Universal Studios, the theme park. And so I think I would go and like surprise him there and probably go ride roller coasters the rest of the day and have, That's awesome. I know, and then have dinner <laughs> at Disney Springs or something like just a theme park day is my best day. That sounds awesome. I mean, I think going forward, when I ask that question, I should email everyone's boss beforehand and, and just surprise <laughs> you. It'll be, like an, it'll be like an Oprah moment. <laughs> like, you have the day off. You have the day off. That'd be awesome. Oh, hey, it's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I still can't. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been really a good learning experience for me in terms of uh, your role and, and how others uh, can get 1% better on building these self-service experiences. Yeah, it was awesome, Randy. Thanks for asking me to join. I had a very good time. All right. So uh, we'll leave you with one uh, last thing uh, we didn't ask you, which was how do we get a hold of you? So if people want to learn more about what you do and uh, maybe get some tips uh, for building self-service experiences in their organization, what, what's the best way to reach you? 
LinkedIn. I'm I'm an antiquarian. I don't have social media beyond uh, LinkedIn, so that's the only place you can find me. <laughs> that's good. All right, we'll put the, put all that in the show notes. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us, and uh, I appreciate your time. Cool. Thank you. Bye. So thanks everyone for joining us. It's been another amazing uh, conversation that matter podcast. And thanks to Rachel, uh, we will be continuing this series around conversational AI in the enterprise. So make sure to listen to our previous episodes if you haven't listened to them and stay tuned for next week for another episode. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.